So this week we are talking about loops. And what a loop really is, is the ability to run your code repeatedly and have different things happen based on different data that's happening within the loop. So, and this is an extension of branching. This is another form of branching. Last week we looked at if, elif, and else as our main branches. Now we're going to look at for and while as a new form of branching, but the branching is really about repeatedly doing your code. Um, and we're going to start talking about code reusability because this is the first time we actually need to think about writing code to be used with different data repeatedly. Um, and this is also my favorite programming topic. I will talk to you a lot about reusability from now until the end of class. Um, why? Why is reusability my favorite topic? Because as a programmer, um, well, the statistics are this. This is just kind of a rule of thumb. If you catch it during the requirements phase, if you catch an issue during the requirements phase, it costs a dollar. If you catch an issue during the development phase, it costs ten dollars. If you, I'm sorry, during the design phase, it costs ten dollars. If you catch an issue at the, in the development phase, it costs a hundred dollars. And if you don't catch it till it goes out to the customer site, it costs a thousand dollars. So you see how those go up by a magnitude each time. One of the ways as programmers that we reduce potential errors is we write our code so it can be reused again and again and again, depending on the input. Depending on what's coming in, we can make our code do the right thing if and write considerably less of it if we concentrate on the reusability of that code and allowing the data to drive what's happening in the code. Um, so that's why it's my favorite. And I'm not, uh, when we're talking about reusability, we do not copy and paste code. You never want to do that. Um, we are using loops and next week functions to, re to reuse code. So this is this week and next week are, are very similar in that respect. Um, and we just don't have as much code to write and maintain, and that's a good thing. So we have some new keywords. While and for are the two types of loops that we have, and we'll explain the difference as we go through this. Um, a while loop, and I'm going to say this 100 times, the while loop is what you will use for your main gameplay loop. For is another type of loop. And the basic difference is that while will run until you tell it not to. So it's an indeterminate amount of time. A for loop always goes over a deterministic set, whether it be the numbers from 0 to 10, whether it be things in a list. Um, so four is really a, is the, the outcome or the, the number of iterations for the most part is predetermined. For, for a while loop, it's not. Okay, then we have in. And in is used with for to check for existence in some sequence, whether it be a list, whether it be a range, in some sequence is what it's going to, it's going to check for existence. Break is literally put the brakes on. It stops a loop in its tracks and, and goes and uh, goes to the next, the next line in the scope. So it'd be like going into the global scope. Continue, stop the execution, but return to the top of the loop. So you still want to keep looping, but you don't want to do anything else within the loop. Whereas break stops the loop. You're done looping. Some new concepts, iteration and sentinel value. Iteration is an execution of a block of Python statements in a loop until the end condition is met. So an iteration is one trip through the loop. And you may have 10, you may have 100, you may have a million trips through the loop. But one 
is an iteration. So you are iterating through the code. A sentinel value is used for while loops, and it is, it's a check to determine if the termination condition of the loop is met. So the sentinel value is really the termination condition for the loop. So I'm in a loop, and I'm going to keep looping until I answer no. So anything else is going to make it the loop keep running. And we'll see examples of that. So I already said this. There's two kinds of loops, while and for. Um, while is used to evaluate code, the code block an unknown number of times. We just don't know. The condition for exit will be, the, sorry, the exit will be determined by the input that's happening in the loop. Four is a known number of times. So you've got a list. You've got some kind of sequence. You've got numbers. Uh, but those are the difference. I use four a lot more than I use while because the type of programming I do is very data-driven. That doesn't say I don't ever use while. I do. But from, from my standpoint, I use it, I use four much more. Okay, we're going to talk about the basics of a while loop. So we have the while keyword, and this tells Python that you're going to make a decision an unknown number of times. Now we have these two things, and by the way, this is challenge 421. We have cur power, and we have user care. User care is the variable who, whose value is going to be tested every time we go through this loop. Um, with a while loop, the value that you're testing, sorry, the variable who holds the value that you're testing, has to be defined before the while loop. If you don't, you're just going to get an unknown error, and, and I'll show you what the, na the nasty little error is that you'll get. Um, so why here is the sentinel value? So it's basically the thing that says, if I match, stop. Um, you can read this statement as long as user care is equivalent to y, keep going. Now just like other forms of branching, while loops and for loops use global scope and local scope. We talked a lot about global scope and local scope last week. Same rules apply here. If you're going to have, well, when you have a loop, you have to have a local scope to that loop. In this case, the local scope is the three lines under it. And Python will know that it's the local scope because you've properly indented it just like you would have indented your if statement. Um, and in this case, what we see here with this challenge is that, first of all, we're going to print it. Then we're going to, sorry, we're going to print cur power. Then we're going to modify that value. And then we're going to modify user care. This is what I mean by data-driven code. User care is changed within the loop. So I could keep saying why. I could type Mississippi. I could type 42. But when we travel back up to that while loop, the top of the while loop, it's going to take that new value from user care and test it against our sentinel value in this case y. And if uh, user care does not equal y, I stop because a loop runs as long as the condition that you're looking at is true. That's why when you look at the initial definition of user care, I say y. So User care is equal to y, so the first time into the loop, I'm guaranteed one trip through the loop. If it wasn't, if user care was n or Mississippi or 42, I would never make it into the local scope of the loop because it would evaluate to false. Uh, Sentinel value is a value which defines the exit condition for the loop. So now let's look at the loop again. 
the entry condition under which the loop statement evaluates to true. I just talked about that. So the entry condition is that user care is why. Um, and don't forget the colon. It's just like a branch. If you don't have that colon, you haven't, an, you haven't ended the sentence, you haven't ended the statement, and uh, Python will, will just give you an error, just like it would have with the for loop. Um, I think I said all this. OK, what's in the orange is the local scope of the while loop. You have to have a local scope. Um, I think I said all that in the last slide. So for your gameplay, and I'm going to go over this a bunch of times over the next several weeks. For your gameplay, you are going to take in user input the first thing inside your while loop, unless you want to print out something. But basically, this is the basic structure, and we'll keep talking about this structure until you guys turn in your game. Um, now we're going to follow the value. And then we'll also, I'm going to reinforce this because we're going to look at it again in PyCharm. I know this is a lot of repetition, but uh, presentation theory says that most people will retain 40% of what you tell them. So if you tell it to them three times, there's a higher probability. So we're going to go through this so we can actually understand the flow of a loop and what an iteration is. So I have user care, which is y, y and which is true. So user care equal to y is true. Perfect. So then I'm going to print cur power, which is 2. I'm then going to modify cur power, which becomes 4. But user care is y. So I'm still true. I go back up to the top of the loop. Iteration 1 is complete. I check this again. It's still true. So I'm going to do the same thing again. This time I'm going to print 4. I'm going to go modify curve power. I'm now going to ask for user care again, and it's no. So I go back up to the top of the loop, and what happens? It's now false. I'm done. The minute that hits false, you're done with the loop. So, and you'll notice that I didn't do any more printing. I've only got two and four on the console output, and that is because there's nothing else to do. We stop and fall out of that loop. So we did two iterations with this. We did the initial iteration through the loop, and then we did a second one when Professor Lisa down there entered Y. So let's talk, let's go back and reinforce that. For 421, where did I put that? 422, it's that one. Uh, okay, maybe we're not. I'll get that one up there. I didn't realize I didn't have 421 already in the stuff. Okay, well, let's just do it like this. We'll just type it in. Okay, I'll just type it in real quick. Uh, I don't have 421 here. Hmm. New Python file. Four two one. Oops, four two one. Four two one. Two user. Here is why. Uh, while, whoops, while is equivalent to y, make sure you do your colon, print cur power, then we're going to say cur power, cur power times 2, and then we're going to say user care is input. And that's it. So now you will notice here, let me make this a little bigger, that I've indented all of these. So let's just try first and run it. So let us do edit the configuration. 
I want my interpreter. Uh, 421. Okay. So now let's just, well, we're going to debug it because you know you guys know how much I like the debugger. So if you look down here, I'm currently in the debug window. You'll notice there are no, no variables. I haven't defined anything yet. I step over, and I have cur power equals 2. I step over again, and I have user care is y. So if I mouse over the statement, I will see that it will evaluate to true. So I know I'm going to go into my loop one time. So now I'm going to print cur power, and we can see it over here in the console window. I'm going to step over again. I just changed the value of cur power. I'm going to step over, and now it's waiting for user input. So I'm going to just put y. So I'm back in the loop again. You'll notice I didn't go up to 1. My blue line is on 4, so I am just going through the loop. I'm going to do this again. Let's look at the debugger. I'm going to do this one more time. Let's look at the debugger. So here's what we have. So I'm going to go through this again happily. I'm going to do the input, and this time I'm going to just say n. Whoops, I've got to go back to the console. Say n, and I'm done. Okay, the program has ended. Oh, sorry, no. But the program hasn't ended. It's got one more thing to do. It's got to evaluate that n. I'm on line four. In this case, it will evaluate to false. It hasn't actually done the evaluation yet. I'm going to step over this, and now I'm done. 248 is what I printed. So let's see a couple of errors. Well, let's start with our happy error of let's just remove the colon. And I get an invalid syntax, which I should. And this is one of those few times where Python actually tells you exactly where the problem is. And the problem is right after that, because I took off my colon. So we're going to have the same kind of indentation problems we had with if. If I do that, I still get all my PyCharm red squigglies. And now I get an indentation error, which is what I should. So the other thing that I see happen a lot, and I'm not actually going to run this, um, is error. And what this is going to do is it's going to cause your loop to run forever. Because user care is not in the loop. Actually, I can debug it so I can break out. So let's debug this guy again. The only change, remember, is line 7. I moved it off to the left. So I'm just going to have my debugger up, and I'm going to step over, and I'm going to print cur power, and I'm going to multiply cur power. But what's going to happen this time is I go back up to the top of the loop. I don't give myself the opportunity to change a thing. And then I'm just going to run again, and I'm going to run again, and I'm going to run again, and I'm just going to keep running because I haven't given anybody in this while loop an opportunity to tell it to stop. So when you're dealing with while loops, make sure that you have an, your exit condition can be met from within the loop, or you will have what we call an infinite loop, and you will get a nasty little message because Zybooks will detect that and give you an odd message that doesn't quite make sense. So that's a gotcha. That is a logic problem. So it's not a syntax problem. You didn't see any red squigglies, and the program run, ran, and it did exactly what I told it to do. I just told it wrong. Okay. So we just did that. So let's continue on with while. Um, we're going to count with while. So counting is something that's actually much better done with a for loop. But you can count with a while loop if you want. 
And the way to do this is instead of requiring input for the, um, uh, sorry, in the loop, basically what you do is your exit condition um, is a certain number of times through the loop and you increment the counter inside the loop. So the increment of the counter right now is num printed equal num printed plus one. So what we have here is if I put three in for num, num stars, then I'm going to print one and then I'm going to go and look at num printed. It's going to increase to one. I'm now going to print another star. Num printed is going to go back up to the top of the loop. Num, uh, num printed has changed now to three. I've done a third iteration through the loop and I'm done because three is not less than three. So, sorry, num printed, let me go back. Num printed is the value that we're checking and num stars comes from user input. So, numbers of stars is whatever the user said. It could have been 10, could have been 100, could have been 2. Um, and as long as the number that I have printed is less than the number of stars the user has input, I'm going to keep going. Now, how do I do that? Well, what, one of the ways I do that is that I make sure I increment inside the loop. So let's go and look at that in the code. 4, 2, 1. Uh, sorry, 4, is that 4, 4, 1? Uh, 4, 4, 4, 2. Sorry about that. 442. There we go. So this is counting with a number. Why is it asking me to add my local interpreter again? Okay, there we go. So we're just going to put our breakpoint here. I'm going to run this, we're going to stop and rerun, don't always download, go away. So, oh, wrong one, my apologies. Didn't change it. 442. Okay. So, now we're going to run this one. And I'm Part of the reason I'm doing counting with a while loop is so that I can show you the difference when we get to the for loop. So I'm going to debug and I'm going to step over line six. Num printed is zero, which is true. I'm going to say num stars. That's my input. So my input is being weighted here. So I'm going to put four and then I'm going to step over num printed is not equal to num stars. So right now I am, um, why did I do that? That's wrong. Hold on. While num printed is less than num stars. Okay, let's try this again. Debug. So it's waiting for the console input. So I'm just going to make the console input four. So num printed is zero. Num stars is four. Zero is less than four. So I evaluate to true. Step over. I print a star. Here's what's important. Here's what changes the, the, um, the check at the top of the loop is that I am incrementing num printed. I'm adding one to it here inside the loop. So I'm effectively changing the exit, um, the, the exit check because I am incrementing num printed. If I didn't increment num printed or if I had a logic error and that was not inside my loop, excuse me, then what would happen is it would run forever and just print 
as many stars as it could until you could find a way to stop it. So let's step over. So I'm here. I'm now num printed is one. Now it's two. We can see that it changes down here under the the variables. So I am now at four. So num printed is four. Num stars is four. So this is going to evaluate defaults. Exit condition of the loop. The loop will run until it evaluates defaults. So I'm done. Same kind of issues could happen here as they happened in the first loop. And the thing that would make it an infinite loop is that. Again, not a syntax error, a logic error. You have to be much more aware of your logic errors once you start to do things like uh, loops and functions and things like that. So that would cause it to run forever. I'm not going to run it because I don't want it to run forever. But um, that is how you change the determination of whether or not the loop stops. OK, so now we're going to look at a for loop. A for loop, it's kind of interesting. There's only two lines there. You'll see that the while loops had more lines. At a minimum for the while loop, you need three lines. You need to define the variable that you're going to check. You need the while statement. And you need something inside that while loop. And hopefully that something is allowing you to control whether or not that loop runs forever. It's different with a for loop. For loop has some nice handy dandy little functions and things you can use with it to make writing code shorter to make, um, yeah, just write a few less lines of code. One of the reasons I like for loops, but also because um, I usually know or can determine what kind of data is coming in and how much of it there is. So I have my keyword for, and it tells Python it's going to make a decision until the exit condition is met. Num is a variable. It's a special variable, not by the name, but by its position. And it is defined within this, the local scope of this loop. So num is not available anywhere else in the code except inside that loop. In tells Python that it's expecting some kind of a sequence or collection. Range creates that collection. So it is a special function. We're going to have a couple slides on it just on its own. And it creates a sequence of numbers. And there's ways to control it. There's ways to make it go so it counts forward uh, positively and it counts negatively. Um, there's a ways you can do it so you can only have even numbers or odd numbers, all kinds of things. This for statement can be read as as long as num is in the sequence of numbers, keep going. Now, while there's no visible sequence here, range will create a sequence for you. And then all we do on the inside is print it. You'll notice there's nothing in there that's explicitly changing the value of num. We just looked at a while loop. In the while loop, you had you, the programmer, had to go out and change that value. You don't have to do that with a for loop. For loop is going to change it for you. For loop will automatically increment the value of num and take that incremented value and see whether or not it's still within the range. And it will either then do what's in the loop or not do what's in the loop. So three lines of code or four lines of code for a while loop, two lines of code for a for loop. That said, you still have to use a while loop for your gameplay loop. A for loop won't work. Um, for loop defines a special variable that is only accessible inside the for loop. 
that's num. Now, it doesn't have to be called num. It just has to be a valid variable name. You could have called that pi. Doesn't matter. Um, range is a special function used just for for loops. Well, not just for for loops, but that's pretty much how we're going to use them. Um, like all conditional statements, the for um, statement has to end with a colon. If you forget the colon, you're going to have unhappiness. And you have to have a local scope, just like you had with a while loop, just like you have with if and else and elif. You have to have a local scope, your code block. It's inside the local scope of the for loop. So let's talk a little bit about that special function range and, and the keyword in. In is used for two purposes. If it determines if a value is contained in a sequence, and it's often used to iterate over a sequence. Now those sound like they're the same, but they're not. Um, you, when we look at lists, you're going to use for loops with the keyword in and the list. And then you might also use a for loop with the keyword in and the, the, the uh, key value pairs of a dictionary. So it doesn't have to be a series of numbers. It can be a series of anything. And it doesn't even have to be a list. It can be a dictionary. So in is very versatile and very powerful for a little two-letter word. But its purpose is to say, okay, there's a sequence coming next. Range is a special function. And what range does is it creates a sequence of numbers. Now, we've, we've used one function so far that can take multiple different arguments. We have print. You can use it. You can just put um, whatever your string is in the print, and it prints it. But we also have that, that form for print where you have a comma and equal something. So <coughs> print has an optional number of arguments. Range has an optional number of arguments. For range, it's a little different. When we use range, we have to have a single number. We must have a single number. And that single number is when you stop. Actually, it's when you stop minus 1 because the number is not inclusive. And that's also something that trips up students when they're doing their labs. You have to remember range is not inclusive of the final number. It is inclusive where you start. It's not inclusive where you stop. Then, to make it a little more confusing, you have two other optional parameters. You have where it's going to start and how you're going to increment it. Because it doesn't have to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It can be 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. It can be, um, you know, 0, minus 2, minus 4, minus 6. So where you start is not required. If you do not give it a where you start, it will assume it's going to zero. It's going to start at zero. Stop is the number you're going to stop at minus one because it's going to start at zero. Increment is just how many you're going to skip. Are you going to add one to it? Are you going to add five to it? That's the increment. So it's going to create this special sequence so that you don't have to. You could, but you don't have to. You can go out and just let range do it for you. So now let's follow this, and we'll see what happens with range. So for this one, there's no teacher needed. I'm saying for num in range 3. So range is creating a sequence, 0, 1, and 2. So num becomes 0. I'm going to print num as 0. I go back up to the top of the loop. I'm now going to get 1. I'm now going to say num is 1. I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. I'm going to get my 2 out of there. And it's num is 2. And then I'm done. And that's how you can visualize 
what happens with a range and a for loop. And it's just pulling something out of the range and then evaluating it and pulling the next thing out of the range and evaluate it. And where it's putting it, when it, after it pulls it out of the range, it's putting it in that variable num. So you can use it in the local scope of the function of the loop. So a little more about range. So in this case, I'm I have four num in range and I have one, six, and two. What in the world does that mean? Well, what this means is that I want range to create a sequence that begins at one, increments by two, and ends at six minus one. So it's going to end at five. So you know what that's going to do? That's going to give me a sequence of odd numbers only. That's how you do it. So if I am running this, I have num. I've got my new range call here. Now the only thing that changed was this range call. This uh, otherwise is the same code. And I have 1, 3, and 5. So I start by using 1. I'm now going to print num is 1. I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. I'm going to have now 3 to use. Num is now 3. So I'm going to print num is 3. I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. And I'm going to print and I've got five now, num is five. And sorry, I gotta change that arrow. Nope, that's not what I wanted to do. So that is how you would go only odds. So if you had to do only evens and you wanted to start at zero, you would do zero. Let's say you wanted to go to 10. So you would say 0, comma 11, comma 2. And that would get you a sequence ranging from 0 to 11. So let's see what time is it. OK, we still got a little time. Um, yeah, let's go do this, and then we're going to go into nested loops, because nested loops are a little bit um, tricky, because you're dealing with a loop inside of a loop, and your inner loop is always going to have to finish for your outer loop, unless you break or continue. So let us do 461. And of course, I don't know what happened to this project. It's not there. Okay, 461. We're just going to add it. Four, four, six, one. Okay. And what was that? Uh, four range. Okay, one, six, two. Four down in range one six two colon whoops forgot my comma print what was it what is print num is print Num is num is okay. So this is very similar to the while loop, except you don't have to worry about doing the increment or the counting here. So if I take a breakpoint at line two, whoops, and Got to go back and edit the configuration. Four, six, one. Okay, now let's do it. So, 
Why didn't it? Debug. Uh, okay. Debug. There we go. Sorry. I don't know why it, the debug didn't stop on the 4. But anyway, if I look at num, it's 1. And if I look at range, I'm not going to see anything. It's just the type of class range. So it's never going to actually give you back that whole sequence. You just kind of have to trust it that it's going to give you the next thing in the sequence. So I have 1. And it'll tell you, that's the nice thing about PyCharm, it'll tell you right here what num is. And so I'm going to print on the console. Num is 1. I'm back up here. As soon as I step over that line, you see num is now 3. Num is 3 because 1 plus 2 is 3. And then 5. And then I'm done. 1, 3, and 5. So that's how you do odd. If you were doing even, you could start at 0, increment by 2 till 6. And if I run this now, you're going to have 0, 2, and 4. Why didn't it get 6? 6 is an even number. It's because it's 6 minus 1. Now, you could also count backwards. I could have my start position at 10. I could have my end position at 2. And I could have my increment be a minus 1. So if I do this, I'm now 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. Because I started at 10 and I increment negatively. So just remember that if you've got any labs that might ask you to go backwards, that's how you do it. So we'll just change these back to what the thing was. But that would be how you go backwards. Okie dokie. Nested loops. We're going to follow this one through and then again we're going to go look at it in PyCharm. Um, so basically what we're doing is we're giving a number of rows and a number of columns, right, nested loops to print a rectangle. So in this case I have two inputs before my for loop. I want the number of rows and the number of columns because I'm going to print a rectangle. And then I have two loops. I have this four outer in-range rows and four inner in-range rows, or in-range columns. Now remember, range, when I just give it one number, that's the stop. So it's always going to start zero, and it's going to be that number minus one. Columns is the same thing. It's going to be a number of columns and minus one. So if I actually go through this, what we're going to have is Professor Lisa is going to put in two and two. So I'm going to say four outer in range. So I have zero and one. Outer is going to be zero. I'm now going to go for inner, and I have zero and one. So inner is going to be zero. So now I'm going to print a star with my end as a space because I don't want a new line. But notice I'm going to the inner loop. I'm not touching that outer loop again. I've just changed inner to one. And I'm done after that. So now I'm going to print my new line and I'm going all the way up to the top of the loop. The outer loop. At this point the outer loop becomes one. The inner loop resets. It's like it never ran before. So it starts at zero. It then goes to 1, prints that second star, then goes to the, to the outer print, and it's done. So you, you have to understand that that inner loop is going to run until it's exhausted, until it's got nothing more to do. Then it's going to go back up to the outer loop, and it's going to increment by whatever it increments, whatever that one increment is. And then it's going to go to the inner loop, and it's going to rerun that inner loop as if nothing happened until it's exhausted again. And then it'll go back up to the outer loop. If the outer loop isn't exhausted, it'll go back to the inner loop, and it will continue to do that. Um, as a programmer, I write a lot of nested loops and a lot of nested ifs. Um, so it, 
it's something that for me I have to always visualize what's happening in the loop. So I hope I actually have this one out there too. If not, I'm gonna have to, to type it. Four eight one. I have four eight two. Uh this'll be good. We'll use this. Num rows, num calls. Okay. So given num rows and num calls, print a list of all seats in a theater. Rows are numbered, columns are lettered as 1A or 3E. Print a space after each seat. This is a good, this is still a good example of, um, yeah, this is still a good example. So we'll use this. So I'm going to do 482. 482 and I'm gonna I'll just set that there let's move this over a bit so uh, let's just give it a debug okay so I'm gonna go to the console I'm gonna say number of rows is five and I'm going to say number of columns Whoops, let me let me step over. Now we got it. Hold on. Let's start this again. Okay. I'm gonna to go to the console. I'm gonna step over. Number of rows is five. Now number of columns, I'm gonna say four. I'm gonna step over. I don't know why this is behaving weirdly tonight. Let's try it one more time, but we're not going to stop here. We're going to debug. I'm on the console, and I'm going to say 5, and I'm going to say 4. Now I've stopped where I want. So for cur row in range 1, so I'm starting at 1, num rows, which is 5, plus 1. Why did I do that plus 1? I did the plus one because I actually want five rows. So I'm telling it to go to six. Six is that final number. By the way, if you do a range with just two entries, it says start, end, and the increment's going to automatically be one. It's the default for it. So I have done something different by saying num rows plus one because I actually want five rows. So, and then I have cur call let, which is just the current letter. So, I am going to step in. So, I have 5, 4, and the cur row is 1. So, this is now 1 because I started at 1 and not at 0. Cur call let is going to be A. And then I'm going to now step in to the inner loop. Now, you'll notice cur call isn't anything yet because we haven't stepped in. As soon as we step over this line of code, now you'll see that cur call actually has a value. You can see it over here. It's still in one num calls plus one. Now, I did this plus one here again on purpose because I really do want there to be four columns. I want it to be a five by four matrix. So I'm going to print the current row, the current column letter with an end that is a colon or a quote. So now I'm on this weird line. Cur call letter equals care or cur call let plus one. So I'm getting the ordinal for the letter. So this is just a built-in function that says turn the letter into what it would be in the alphabet. So A was 1, now I'm going to add 1 to A and it's going to give me a B. So you'll notice that cur call let is now B. I am still on that inner loop. I haven't exhausted that inner loop yet. I haven't made it to my four columns. So now I'm going to step over this again. I'm on the second column. And by the way, on the console, I just printed 1A. I'm now going to step over. It's going to print out. Now it's going to print 1B right next to it. 
I'm going to step over. Now I'm at 3. I'm, I did the ordinal before, so now I'm at C. Now I'm doing this, and now I'm at D. So I'm now here. I have 1, 2, 3, 4. I did 4 plus 1, and so it has to be less than the end, so it's going to be done. So now I, I'm up at the outer loop. The outer loop says, I'm still on the current row number one. I haven't moved. I've added seats, but I haven't moved the row. So now I'm going to row, move the row again. I reset Kerr Call Let to A because I want it to start fresh when I go into the inner loop. So I step over, and now I'm going to start this whole thing again because you're looking and saying, well, Kerr Call is four. How do I do it? Because I am, I've am, i just come from that outer loop, Python knows that, and it's going to reset the inner loop for me. So that's what it just did. It reset it for me, and this is not going to be right. I needed an extra print there, didn't I? Well, yeah, we'll put the print there when we tag it. So now, well, let's just do that. I just want to make it right, sorry. After we're all done with this, what we need to do is print. So it does a new line. So now, sorry, I'm going to debug again, but I'll go faster this time. I'm going to print 5 and 4. So let's go through that first one and get to where we were, A, B, C, D. So now I'm at E. Oh, I did them backwards. I'm going to get the new ordinal number, which is F. I am now at column 5. What number did I put in there? Num calls was six. Oh, sorry about that. I added. I just hit the wrong key. So now I'm at F. Now the difference that I did here is that when I fall out of that inner loop, I'm, I'm adding a print. So I actually do a new line because I didn't do that before. Now I'm at the outer loop again. I'm resetting, remember. I reset the inner loop. So this inner loop is brand new. I've reset Kerr Call Let because that's on me, but the rest of it, the rest of the resetting is Python. So I'm going to now say 2A, 2B, 2C, 2D, and 2E, and 2F. I am now done again with this inner loop. Whoops. So I'm going to step over. I'm now going to print. Remember, this isn't the same justification as that 4, so it's not inside the inner for loop. I'm now printing my um, new line, and I'm going to go in again. Now I'm cur row is three, so I've moved down a row, and I'm going to run through this again. I'm going to now print it, and I'm going to run through it one more time. Oh, how many did I put in there? For num rows, five, sorry. We'll just finish this up quick. So you see how you can build a big rectangle with just a couple of lines of code? Pretty interesting. You might have to build a triangle, a right triangle, which will be uh, a little trickier, but you'll be able to do it. But you'll do it by using uh, nested for loops. So I hope that was clear. But that's how, that's how the mechanics of nested loops. And by the way, you can nest while loops. And you can have a loop with an if. You can have a, a branch with a loop inside of it. All of the things that we've learned up to date can all be combined in any kind of way. Now, sometimes you want to be careful. You don't want to make them overly complex. But... They're, they can all be combined however you want them to be combined. And we'll get to the, um, 
we'll get to the labs now. So, given a line of text as input, output the number of characters excluding spaces, periods, or commas. So what we're going to do here is for each character in the text. So a string, as we've learned, is simply a sequence of characters made for, uh, for and in. It's completely what it was made for. So here, I'm just going to have for each character in whatever my user text is that was put in. Now, inside my for loop, I have an if statement. That if is going to say, and it's a compound if statement, so you've got to remember how those work. If the character that you've just gotten out of that string is not equal to a space, it's not equal to a period, and it's not equal to a comma, then and only then am I going to increment a care count. Now notice uh, outside of that loop I have set care count to zero because I had to create it. it and I think I didn't say this before. If you're going to use it in the global scope, it has to be created in the global scope. I eventually want to print out care count in the global scope. The way I do that is I make sure it's defined before I hit my for loop. So user or care count is defined outside of the for loop because later on I'm going to use it outside of the for loop. Um, so that's what this is. This is a single for loop, but it has a complex branch in it. And these little orange things are just to remind you about indentation. Because in this case, you have multiple indentation. You have the indentation of the if and the indentation of the block of the if statement. Okay. Here, you're going to modify some letters. So it's um, a user created passwords are simple and easy to guess. Write a program that takes a simple password and makes it stronger by replacing characters using the key below and by appending Q star S to the end of the string. So I basically I have a string. That's somebody's going to put in a string. And I'm going to create a new password from that string. But there are some rules. And the rules are these if then else statements. So here I use a while, but since you're using a string, you could just as easily use a for loop. Um, and basically, you are going through the um, word that was input, and you're creating a brand new word for output. And the way you do that is you're going to concatenate them. So you're going to say password equal password plus whatever that character was or the character count was. And so all you do is you, you basically say, if my character is an I, then the same place in the password is now going to be an exclamation point. If my character is a lowercase a, it's now going to be the at. If it's um, an M, it's going to be a capital M. If it's a B, it's going to be an A. And if it's an O, it's going to be a dot. And then make sure that at the very end you do Q star S and you output the password. So this seems like it's kind of long, but it really isn't. It's, very, it's again, you recognize the patterns. This, the patterns are right here, and this is the criteria for the password. And it matches exactly the problem statements. You are going to have to make sure you indent properly again. While is going to be left justified, or the for is going to be left justified. And then you have an if. You have a series of elifs and an else. They all have to be justified correctly. And the same with what's happening on the inside of those branches. Um, and this is pseudocode, so we don't have colons. Don't forget your colons. OK, so here's one that sounds more complex, but it really isn't. Um, so here you have a program that will output a right triangle based on user specified height and uh, triangle height and symbol. Um, 
Ah, oh, crap. I forgot to do break and continue. We're going to go back and do those real quick. Um, I don't know why I didn't have those slides. So we're going to input a character, a height, and then we're going to do a counter. So we're going to say, well, counter is less than height. We could have also used a for loop. We have an inner counter, and then we're going to create a second loop. We're going to have this inner counter is less than or equal to counter. And so then I'm going to print out that number. So if I start at 1, the inner loop is only going to print 1. And then I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. And then if counter is 2, the inner loop is only going to print 2. And then I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. And if counter is 3, the inner loop is going to print 3. Because remember, it always starts at that inner loop always gets cleared out once it hits the top of the loop again, once it hits the top of the outer loop. So that's how you're going to do your right triangle. And I have to apologize. I don't know where those slides went. Okay. We're going to look at challenge 4, 10, 1. So break halts the execution of a loop. Continue causes Python to stop execution. So let's go look at 4, 10, 1. There we go. My apologies. Okay. So we have an opportunity to control a loop. Break and continue are keywords that control the execution of the loop. Sometimes you just want to stop. Just stop the loop. Just be done. Sometimes you want to start the loop again. You want to continue. You don't want to do anything more. You want to stop the execution where it is, but you don't want to break the loop. You don't want to completely exit it. You just want to go back up to the top, and that's what continue does. Um, so let's just, I'm sorry, I know we're running late. Let's just run through this real quick. And 10, I will show you. Um, so let's debug. It's looking for assignment pattern and a user pattern. So the Simon pattern, let's say it's going to be A, B, C, D. And the user pattern is going to be A, B. Okay. So if Simon pattern does not equal user pattern, break. If not, user score plus one, user pattern equals input. So basically I'm changing the user input. I'm sorry, Simon pattern is not equal to user pattern. So I don't actually... Uh, so it breaks. Let's do that again. So I'm going to say the Simon pattern is A, B, C, D. The initial user pattern is A, B, C, D, E. Because Simon pattern is not equal to user pattern, evaluate to false, I'm going to step over that break statement. I'm going to change the user score. And then here, I'm going to do user pattern equals new input, whatever that new input is. So now I'm going to type AB. And I'm going to go up to the top of the loop, which I did. And by the way, this is while true. Now we'll talk about that in a minute. Simon pattern is not equal to user pattern. And so what I will do here is I will break. I go to the break statement, and the next thing that happens is I go to the print statement. It skipped user score, and it skipped user pattern. So I'm going to print this out. So my user score is 1. Now what if I wanted to keep this going? I didn't want to break, but I didn't want to add to the score. So I could do something by changing this to continue because I want you to see the difference. So if I now debug this, I'm going to say user pattern is DE. So the two patterns are now the same. 
So this is going to be false, so I'm not going to go to the continue, and I'm going to do user score. Oh, it's waiting. So the console, AB. So Simon pattern is not equal to user pattern, A, B, C, D, E, A, B. I'm going to hit continue. Now the problem here is that I'm never going to hit the user pattern again. And I've actually seen people do something similar to this in their, um, that's an infinite loop, in their game. They do not use the user input in the right place. So, and it becomes a logic error. So I can simply do this, get rid of this, and, my, and, and that continue will act completely different. Let's take a quick look. So I'm going to say A, B, C, D, E. And now I'm going to say A, B, C, D, E. So I have A, B, C, D, E for Simon pattern, A, B, C, D, E for the user pattern. And user pattern is not equal, so we're not going to hit that continue. We're just going to say user score plus one. Now I'm going to, to ask for the user pattern again. And if I say A, B, I am, I, I am now true because AB does not equal ABCDE. And now I'm going to hit that continue, and I will go up to the top of the loop, and I'm asking for input again. So I can then say AD, and the same thing will happen. Now I don't have a way to break out of this loop, but I wanted to show you the difference between continue and break. So if I put break back in here, what will happen is D E D C D E. So they're the same. So now it that if statement evaluates defaults, I add up my user code. Now I'm going to ask for input. A, B, and now I'm going to break and I'm done. I'm just going to print out the user score. So that's the difference in break and continue. When you are doing your game, you're going to have to understand how continue works because if someone puts in, you know, Mississippi instead of north, because teachers do that sometimes when they test, hint, um, you're going to want to make sure you capture that and go back to the top of your loop. So I hope that wasn't too rushed for break and continue. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Bria. You can open up your mic, too, if you want, or you can type it in here. It's up to you. Hello. Hello. Hi. It's easier to talk. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yes, ma'am. So I was working on more Zybook stuff today. I got. I don't know if this is something that we have to worry about too much, but I got to the problem with the factorial coding and looping, which is like a nested looping option. Yeah. And I, my brain just stopped. <laughs> is that in the lab, or is that a challenge? Uh, it was. I don't, I don't think, think it, was, it wasn't a challenge because I could move past it. <laughs> I was trying it out, and I, I just had to push past it because I just could not get it. I sat on it for like an hour, and I just my brain would just not connect it together. Recursion, true factorial calculations really do require something called recursion which we don't use in this class. Ah. We also don't go that much into math. Okay. So for this class, you don't need to worry about it. If I were writing a factorial function, mm -hmm. I would write it using recursion. 
which like I said we don't go into in this class but I also think Python has a factorial method so I don't think you need to worry about that that is not something that will be part of any project or your or assignment or anything like that okay I, I appreciate that because I, I felt like there was a missing piece because I, I hit it and just completely roadblocked I was like I don't remember reading anything about this so okay no. that, that makes me feel better that's why I wanted to ask to make sure it wasn't something I needed to go study more for later no yeah. you don't need to worry about that later that okay. is not going to be any part of the future of this course factorial no 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 I appreciate it thank you no problem does anybody else have any other questions going once Okay, you guys have a wonderful weekend. I will have this up tomorrow, and I hope to see you next week. I'm going to stop the recording.